acetals, amines, oxemes, hydrazones, enamines, all of these products of the condensation of a ketone or aldehyde with a heteroatomic nitrogen, oxygen, or sulfur nucleophile can be converted back to the ketone or aldehyde through treatment with water and an acid catalyst. And this is because these nucleophilic additions are ultimately reversible. So by adding a large excess of water, by putting the product of the condensation in a large quantity of water, we can drive the reaction back toward the side of the ketone and aldehyde plus nucleophile. This is a process known as hydrolysis, since water, in acting as a nucleophile, as we'll see, is cleaving, for example, a CN double bond and an imine, or a CN single bond and a CC double bond and an enamine, or two CO bonds and an acetal. Water is responsible for the cleavage of bonds through its action as a nucleophile. This is what's known as hydrolysis. And acidic water is universally used for these. So something like H3O plus and H2O, or a specific acid in aqueous solution can be used for hydrolysis. And the cool thing about hydrolysis is once you've really understood on a deep level those condensation mechanisms that we've looked at previously for imines and enamines and acetals, you can appreciate hydrolysis as what's called the microscopic reverse of these mechanisms. It's the same mechanism just essentially run backwards in time, if you like, or in reverse, with reverse electron flow, for example. So, for instance, beta elimination is the microscopic reverse of nucleophilic addition. The AD sub N step and E beta step are reverses of one another. If in the forward direction an AD N step is occurring, the reverse direction corresponds to a beta elimination step. Proton transfer is its own reverse. If a proton transfer is being transferred from an acid to a base in the forward direction, the transfer from the conjugate acid to the conjugate base in the reverse direction is the reverse of that proton transfer. So proton transfer is its own reverse in a sense. D sub n, loss of a leaving group, is the microscopic reverse of A sub n, coordination of a nucleophile to a cationic center and so on and so on and so forth. So to think about the mechanisms of hydrolysis, we can just look back at these condensation mechanisms, start with the products, and work them backwards. And I want to do that here for the acidic hydrolysis of an acetal as an example, and I encourage you on your own to work through the mechanisms of hydrolysis for imines and enamines under acidic conditions to really get this idea down. So to revisit this, let's back up to our mechanism of formation of acetals that we saw in sort of two stages. Acid catalyzed nucleophilic addition was the first stage. In this mechanism, acid, HA, is catalyzing the addition of R2OH to the ketone here. And the result is a hemiacetal. So this is acid catalyzed nucleophilic addition on the first slide. On the second slide, in the second stage, we see acid-catalyzed SN1, with acid protonating SN1 occurring through elimination followed by addition, and then a final proton transfer regenerating the, the acid catalyst and giving the acetal product. So this is kind of acid-catalyzed SN1 or acid-catalyzed elimination followed by nucleophilic addition. Now let's look at the hydrolytic mechanism and see how this is the microscopic reverse of acetal formation. All right, so let's return to the hydrolytic reaction here. And first of all, before we dig into the mechanism, let's notice here that the products, the ketone and two equivalents of alcohol, are the reactants of acetal formation. And so we use water, which is a product of acetal formation, as a reactant here, along with the acid catalyst. This accelerates the process. And the products are the starting ketone, as well as two equivalents of alcohol. And using solvent quantities of water here is critical to ensure that this reaction goes in the forward direction completely. All right, so we start with protonation of one of the acetal oxygens, and it doesn't matter which one, as the two OR groups are equivalent. At this point, recall that the idea was nucleophilic addition of an alcohol to a carbocation that resembled a protonated carbonyl. What we're doing here now is beta elimination of that alcohol back off to get back to this same intermediate structure that, remember, looks like a protonated carbonyl, but it's got an R group from the alcohol attached to it. It's electrophilic at this carbon. 
and this has kicked off a molecule of ROH. So in the forward direction, ROH comes in, does nucleophilic addition. In the hydrolytic direction, in reverse, beta elimination of that alcohol occurs. Now water enters the picture. Water adds in an AD sub N step to give this reactive intermediate. And recall here that in the forward direction, what happened was the elimination of water. So in the forward direction, it's a nucleophilic addition of water and notice we're getting closer to that hemiacetal intermediate. And in fact, after loss of a proton from this protonated hemiacetal, well, we get back to the hemiacetal. And we're done with the uh, second stage, if you will, of acetal formation in reverse, which is the first stage of the hydrolysis mechanism. At this point, it's a good point now to pause and see if you can draw the rest of the mechanism on your own keeping in mind that where we're going is ultimately to the neutral carbonyl, another equivalent of alcohol, and recovering the acid catalyst. All right, so what's going to happen here is acid-catalyzed beta elimination, the first stage of acetal formation in reverse. So first, we protonate the alcohol oxygen, since we're ultimately going to eliminate that alcohol oxygen under these hydrolytic conditions. All right, this creates a situation where beta elimination is poised to occur. The OH oxygen can sort of kick off HOR as a leaving group. And this gets us back to the protonated carbonyl intermediate and eliminates that second equivalent of alcohol. Finally, at this point, in comes A minus, the conjugate base of the acid catalyst, and removes that proton to get us back to the neutral carbonyl containing product. And so this entire mechanism is the microscopic reverse of acetal formation. And to really drive that home, I encourage you to compare this to your notes on acetal formation so that you can see how these are the reverse of one another. And this is true of all hydrolytic reactions of these carbonyl condensation products, imines, enamines, acetals, etc. They all operate on this basic principle that the elementary steps of the mechanism are the microscopic reverses of the steps in the condensation reaction. This slide highlights a couple of examples of something we've already been discussing, that hydrolytic conditions can be applied to imines, enamines, and other products of condensation of heteroatomic nucleophiles with ketones and aldehydes. So for example here, this imine reacts with water under acidic conditions in the presence of an acid catalyst to give the starting carbonyl compound and a primary amine. The reactant of imine formation is a primary amine, right? So what we get here is a primary amine. And one thing to note is that it, the H2O became incorporated into the primary amine, there are the two H's, and the carbonyl compound product as the carbonyl oxygen. Enamines, likewise, are converted into a ketone or aldehyde and a secondary amine. And here, note that the H2O became incorporated into an H here on the secondary amine, an H at the alpha carbon of the carbonyl compound and the carbonyl oxygen. So here, the H's are a little bit trickier to spot, but one of them does become incorporated into the carbonyl compound product. In applying these hydrolysis reactions, make sure that you can draw both the ketone or aldehyde product and the nucleophile byproduct of this reaction. You'll often be asked to draw both in problems. On this slide, we're gonna practice identifying the products of hydrolysis reactions of carbonyl condensation products acetals, enamines, imines, etc. And we want to draw both products, both the ketone or aldehyde as well as the nucleophile product. So here's how I tend to think about this. First, we want to identify the bond that's broken via hydrolysis. Is it a carbon-nitrogen bond, carbon-oxygen bond, carbon-sulfur bond, that kind of thing? We want to look for the carbonyl carbon. And one thing to keep in mind with all of these reactions is that because in the condensation reaction in the forward direction, a molecule of water is eliminated, ultimately they're substitution reactions and they're actually redox neutral. There is no change in oxidation level at the carbon that was the carbonyl carbon. And so you can use oxidation and reduction considerations to identify that carbonyl carbon. And that's going to be key in identifying the ketone or aldehyde product. So, for example, in this first case, we can recognize that there is a carbon with two bonds to oxygen in this structure, and it's this carbon right here, right at the center. If we think about oxidation number here, this carbon has an oxidation number of plus two, and that is equivalent to the oxidation number of a carbon 
in a ketone. That's a big hint that this is the carbonyl carbon. This is the future carbonyl carbon in the products of hydrolysis. We can also recognize that those two CO bonds are a dead giveaway for an acetal, given that both of those CO bonds are involved in alkoxy groups, right? This just happens, the two alkoxy groups just happen to be tethered together, but this is absolutely an acetal. And so what we can do at this point to draw the products is imagine adding H2O as a CO double bond here with the two H's headed to the two oxygens of the acetal group. And the result is this ketone right here. There's our carbonyl carbon that we recognized. And this diol, and it's a diol because the two OH groups happen to be tethered together by this three carbon sort of tether here. Now, what about the second case? Well, in the second case, we have a nitrogen connected to a CC double bond. This is an enamine. And I've gone ahead and drawn out one of the implied hydrogens right here, actually the only implied hydrogen at this carbon, because it's going to be useful in drawing the products of this reaction. So here now, we have this carbon that's linked to the nitrogen and part of the CC double bond is the carbonyl carbon. If this is going to be our future carbonyl carbon after water, well, first of all, this is protonated and then water adds in at that carbon highlighted in blue, and ultimately the nucleophile HNME2 is eliminated. So here we want to visualize a carbonyl group right there and HNME2 as eliminated off. And these are indeed the, the products. So here's our carbonyl carbon. Our nucleophile is eliminated off as HNME2 here. And notice that the elements of water become incorporated into the product. So this O is the O in water. This H is one of the H's in H2O. And where does the other H in the H2O go? Well, it forms a bond to the alpha carbon. So we could imagine it being right there. So our two H's and our oxygen are the elements of water, and there they are. Okay, in the last case, similar to the first, we've got a carbon with two bonds to oxygen. So we've got an acetal functional group. And because the structure is a little funky here, it's a funky bicyclic structure, I've gone ahead and numbered the carbons, as this is going to get a little bit tricky. So what happens here? Well, carbon two is pretty clearly the nucleophilic, uh, the electrophilic carbonyl carbon, rather. And we can tell that because this is the carbon that's linked to both oxygens. And it's an acetal. And so to draw the product, we can imagine a carbonyl group appearing right here with cleavage of the two CO single bonds and two H's ending up there. There are a few different ways one can imagine drawing this. Here's how I drew it. Carbons one and six, you know, trying to keep things as similar to the starting structure as possible, and five are there. Carbon seven, I've drawn sort of up here, and then carbon two, I sort of folded up. You can imagine kind of swinging this carbon up like this, and the aldehyde group appears here. Notice there is an implied hydrogen at carbon two that's easy to miss, but that carbon needs four bonds, so there is a hydrogen there, and the carbonyl compound here is an aldehyde. <clears throat> O3 is still tethered to carbon 5 via carbon 4, and I've tried to leave that sort of arm of the product as close to the starting material as possible. And so here, nothing else is eliminated, right, since the two hydroxyl groups um, that were kicked off in the course of the mechanism remain tethered to the carbonyl group. 